applause for Jen Simmons. So much like Rachel, as I've been learning more and more about grid and what we can do about it and been thinking a lot like Mark around theory and design and what does this mean for graphic design on the web, I also have been going down a lot of rabbit holes and reading a lot of specifications like the CSS2 specification to understand what the heck some of this stuff is in order to better understand how all these pieces work together. And as I was doing that, I felt like... Um, there was something missing in my understanding of the web. There was something fundamental that I would read the Flexbox specification or I'd read the grid specification. I would see little notes that would say something like, well, of course, this depends on what the writing mode is. And I'm like, what the heck is that? What is this writing mode? And when I finally had time, I went to really figure out what is underpinning everything, how it is that grid and Flexbox and flow of content even works in the first place. Understanding that, understanding writing modes really is key to all of that. In the beginning, there was the, <laughs> of the web, there, was, uh, there were choices that were made. Choices made about how content would be on the page, how layout would work, how flow would work. Computers in the late 80s, early 90s all typically worked in the same way. They worked in this kind of Western mode of left to right writing languages. But as Bruce Lawson has been saying a lot lately, as he's traveling around giving talks, WWW stands for the wide world web. It doesn't stand for the wealthy Western web. Um, and the web really needs to support both in the speed of the connections and the, the performance of our sites, but also in the graphic design, the layouts, the languages, the CSS itself needs to support a wide range of scripts and of possibilities. If you look at the human language, the history of human language, there's actually been some really crazy things that we humans have come up with when we invented writing language, uh, written languages. There are different ways that languages have flowed in a circle, back and forth in a zigzag, uh, and in vertical, different kinds of vertical scripts. Um, so CSS for, at the beginning, didn't support any of those. And at this point, the writing mode specification is on a mission to fully support all modern scripts, all scripts that are being used in wide use today. There's not support for, say, ancient Egyptian that kind of laid things out like this. But there is support for all the languages that are being used um, commonly. And I'm going to talk today about three CSS properties, direction, writing mode, and orientation. Uh, we'll get into all of those later. But before we do, I'm going to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole into the display specification, which Rachel was talking about before. It feels like, you know, uh, it's time to go and, like, I started reading it a couple, I don't know, a month or so ago, going, what the heck is in here anyway? Um, and, today, and I'm specifically talking about the draft at the moment, um, the level three draft. So I'm sure any of you who write CSS, you're totally familiar with display block, how that works. Display inline, how that works. Display inline block, what that does. Right? These are the display properties that we're used to, the ones that we know of. If you were going to take a quiz, these are the ones you'd probably write down from memory. They all work like this, display value. But there's a proposal in the current draft of kind of changing the mental model. And I don't know if this proposal, there have also seen some uh, debates about whether or not that's not the perfect mental model. Maybe we're going to go and make it even more complicated and make another one. But I like this mental model. Even if we never write code like this, I think it's definitely, it changed the way that I think about display. It helped me understand what's going on. The idea would be that we have a uh, display outside inside. The outer display type dictates how the box participates in its parent's formatting context. And the options are block, inline, and run-in. OK, so what's run-in? I was like, what the heck is run-in? Uh, so I'm not going to talk at all about run-in, because it doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, but in not talking about run-in, at least um, it's really cool. <laughs> Uh, maybe we want it to exist. So if you take, say, like in the spec, there's an example of a definition list, and you've got a definition title and a definition definition, or whatever, DTDT. -D -D. Uh, those are siblings next to each other. There's no a wrapper around them, but maybe you want to, you know, do you have to put a div around them in order to? So what you could do is you could put a display run in on the uh, DT, and it sort of takes the T out of the regular flow, and it injects it into the beginning of the D 
the next adjacent sibling as an inline element. Um, and you can see there at the very bottom, you can see the results where the word dictionary is then right next to its title. Um, run in, kind of awesome, maybe we want it, but okay, I'm not going to talk about that today. So um, display, block, display, inline, right? Those are our two options for how a particular element participates in its parents', parents uh, formatting context. And then the display inside is like, hey, what the heck is going on on the inside of this element in the layout mode of the what's going to go on in the guts in here? Um, and we've got options today, flow, flow, root, which is pretty awesome, uh, table, flex, Ru uh, Ruby grid, right? And you could put those two things together, and this is where the mental model really began to shift for me. Instead of thinking of it as block, it's block and flow. So the outer context is block, but the inner one is just a regular flow of content. Or flow root is really block and flow root. Inline flow, inline flow root. Flow root, by the way, if you know what a BFC is, a block formatting context, flow root just establishes a new block, block formatting context, um, which could be like a whole other talk, another rabbit hole to go down on another day. But um, it's a way, basically, for us to not have to use uh, mix-ins like uh, at include clear fix because it activates what we need in order to do a clear fix in our own code with pure CSS. Um, so flex and inflex then become like block flex, inline flex, right? Oh, everything's either block or inline on the outside. There's also other display properties, display none, display contents, which Rachel talked about, um, and some other stuff, the stuff for creating marker boxes on list items and for Ruby and all the things with table cells and table everything, table. Um, but so what does this have to do with writing modes? Well, on the web, everything having to do with layout in, builds on these ideas of block and inline. They are, in fact, the foundation of everything. Which direction does inline go? Which direction does block go? Writing mode specification lets you adjust those and change what those two things do, which then has implications on everything else that's going on. So inline, to be clear, inline, when you're reading or writing in this direction, that's the way in which the characters actually flow. The flow inside the line boxes is the inline direction. And then the way the block boxes stack is the block direction. There's also char character orientation, so the, way, the direction in which the actual characters themselves point. Which way is up for the characters themselves? And when you combine those three things together, you get a writing system. This is kind of overlaying CSS over top of writing systems as they exist, having nothing to do with the web. But if, smashing those two ideas together, this is kind of how you would define a writing system when you're thinking about the web. Um, character orientation, inline direction, and block direction. So if you combine those three things together, a system, Latin alphabets, the majority, actually, of languages around the world, the majority of scripts, work in a system like this. The system for English, the system that the web was born knowing how to do. Um, it also is for Cyrillic and all the languages that are in Cyrillic, Brahmic scripts, uh, Tibetan, Thai, many African scripts, including Ethiopian. It's really a majority of the world. On this map, sort of all the languages that are dominant in the blue areas on this map. Um, and then if you've done, many of you who've done internationalization, the thing that comes up first has been supporting Arabic, Hebrew, and other languages that work in a right to left direction. So here is the drawing of what that does, right? The block direction is still going top to bottom. The character orientation is still upright, but the inline direction is right to left. So that brings us to our first CSS property. It's called the direction property. And if you were going to use it, you would write it like this, direction RTL, direction LTR. It's been around forever. Uh, I don't know, actually, if it was in CSS1 or if CSS2. It seems like it was added in CSS2, but somebody can correct. These two gentlemen can correct my history later. Um, it's in, at least it was in IE 5.5. It's been around forever, right? It's super, it's so old that it's not on Can I Use because it was there before Can I Use. Um, but authors should not use direction Love the CSS writing specification. <laughs> Don't use direction. Um, why? Because really what you need to be doing is specifying whether it's a right to left language or a left to right language in the HTML itself. It's not something that should fall off when the CSS falls off. It has to do with the content itself. It's a semantic, it's like part of what it means for this thing to be HTML. So you should be setting this on your HTML element. You should also be setting your language. So here language equals E-N-U-S, which is English, uh, the way the United States spells, spells things like the word color, direction, LTR. 
or here, language, Arabic, AR for Arabic, direction, RTL, right? Many of us know this already. This is how you're going to set direction for an entire document by setting it on the HTML element. Now, when you set something on the HTML element, like your direction, what you're doing is you're saying, hey, I got, this is what I want you to do with the content inside having to do with the writing mode. You're also saying, this is how I want the browser to behave and understand how page scrolling should work. So in this case, you can see on the right, the scroll bar is actually on the left side instead of on the what we people who use, are dominant in English might, or other Latin-based systems are used to having the scroll bar on the right-hand side. Right here, it flips the scroll bar to the other side. And it does that because the actual HTML element is getting information about which direction, which writing mode is, this works in. You might also think that, hey, does that, you know, this design is a mirror image. This is what web designers have been typically doing. Your RTL design is the mirror of your LTR design if you have both. In this case, it's the United Nations website, which is in multiple languages. It doesn't happen by magic, though. If you're using a float-based system, you're having to write float, you're having to say things like float right and switch it to float left, or float left and switch it to float right for your two different directions. Um, and a lot of fiddly, fragile, hand-coded practices were invented to handle that kind of stuff. Um, but what it does do is it changes the inline direction. It changes the way that the text flows. Um, so the text flow is automatically switched in certain cases that I'll get into in a minute. But the layout itself is going to um, need more attention. And this is where things like Flexbox and Grid come in. So this is what we've got so far, right? We've got these two different writing modes, writing systems that I'm showing you, and the two properties that we've got, the two attributes that we have in order to specify what we're doing. But you don't, you, you don't have to just set RTL, LTR on the whole page. You could set it on any block level thing, although rather than putting it as an attribute on a block level element, you put it as, you put the attribute in a BDO wrapper. That's how you do it. So this particular paragraph, I want this paragraph to be marked as being in Arabic, so I'm going to put a BDO with a dir of L L LTR. Um, or here, an inline, if I have something inline, I would just have a little phrase and I want to mark it as being RTL, I can use um, BDI and say, hey, this particular phrase is an inline thing, I want that to be marked. So really we've got three different ways to say uh, which direction we want it to go in. So here's an example. I have a big page at this URL with a whole bunch of different options. This particular section, and the section is that outer, the outer box, that yellow box. Um, I say, hey, this particular section, I want this to be a direction of RTL. If I zoom in here, you know, the first time I did this, I expected my English words to be flowing in the opposite direction, and they weren't. And I was like, what the heck? I've used the HTML to to send some CSS, to tell it to flow the other direction. Why is it not flowing the other direction? Now, my headline, set direction to RTL, you can see that it started over on the right instead of starting over on the left. And you can see these numbers, one, two, three, those are not actually list items, UL or LI or anything. Those are just, I just put a number in my paragraph inside parentheses. And the browser recognized those as a kind of number and it moved it over. There's also a period that would have been at the end of the sentence after the word would, but instead it's at the very beginning of that bottom line. So there's a few things that moved over, but in general the rest of the words are flowing in a left to right direction. So why? It's happening because that information about which direction the text should flow is actually not coming from CSS. It's baked into Unicode. It's baked into the script itself. So the browser says, well, that's English. I know that English is an LTR language, so I'm going to relay it out LTR. There's lots of little tiny details like that, and I'm not going to get into all of that. This is not a talk on internationalization or on Unicode or on bidirectional text. Um, but there are little details around punctuation and around things that are like neutral. They're called neutral characters, where it's like, well, it could be one way or the other. And setting the direction actually is basically telling the browser, hey, I want you to do something with the neutrals. 
And meanwhile, it's going to go ahead and do the scripts in the way that it wants to do them. Um, there is a CSS property called Unicode by die for overriding what's happening in Unicode. Here is it, it, it's in the spec. You can read about it if you want. But also, the writing mode specification says authors should not be using Unicode by die. So don't use Unicode by die. I didn't tell you about it. Um, if you want to learn more about bidirectional text and all the nerdy nerd nerdiness, uh, Fantasy Elika uh, put together this talk. Um, on, it's up on YouTube that you can watch. Um, she understands all this stuff, and it's interesting. So here we go. We got these three things, right? These three, three, three ways to do two different scripts. That gets us to, we got the blue and the orange covered. So what about the green here? What about scripts that can be typeset in a vertical direction? How is it that we're going to do that in CSS? Um, it actually was a while before computers could even do vertical text at all, uh, far later than it should have been, honestly. Um, this is somebody typing in Japanese. So there's two systems I want to show you. There's systems that, like Mongolian, the, the Mongolian language, Mongolian scripts, where the block direction is left to right, and the inline direction is top to bottom. You can see here, like these numbers, one, two, three, four, that's an ordered list, one, two, three, four, and it goes one, two, three, four. Why? Because the block direction is going that direction. There's a diagram up on Wikipedia that's like, hey, on the w Wikipedia page for Mongolian, that's like, hey, if Wikipedia were typeset properly in Mongolian, perhaps it would look like this. Um, and for many of us, it sort of feels like the page is sideways, <laughs> but the image itself is, is upright, right, the logo. There's also Han-based systems. So languages like Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and many, many more are all based on, uh, they all have kind of the same ancient roots. And they run where the block direction is right to left, and the inline direction is top to bottom. Or they usually frequently do. Although, if you go to China or you go to other countries, sometimes, actually, you'll see signs where, like the signs on the side of a van, where the kind of block direction is front of the car to back of the car, <laughs> or outer edge of the building to inward edge of the building. So there are situations where Asian languages can actually be vertically, when they're vertically typeset, they can kind of go either direction. And talking to people who understand those languages, they, they're like, well, I don't know, you just know. You just look at the sign and you know which way it goes because of um, both maybe because of the words are obvious, but also because the Context makes it obvious. But for today's purposes, I'm just going to talk about Han-based systems in magazines and in kind of typesetting in books and in written word. The tradition is to go from right to left in a block direction. But actually, Han-based systems, uh, a lot of these languages, it's really proper. You could go either way. Um, my understanding at this point is that China, everything was all vertical, but then um, started to change, especially with the Chinese, the revolution, the cultural revolution. It was this big emphasis on switching to a horizontal writing mode, and everything kind of got switched to a horizontal writing mode. Other countries uh, didn't have that pressure culturally, but the switch to computers and computerizing everything, because computers were horizontal, things had kind of just switched to horizontal, and horizontal feels much more modern to a lot of folks. Um, I talked to some friends, and they're like, well, you know, I learned, a vertical uh, friend in Korea, went as a, you know, she learned to read vertically as a kid, but really that feels old-fashioned and more traditional, and kind of poems and things will be typeset vertically, but lots of other stuff will be typeset horizontally. F to her, reading horizontally is easier on the eyes, and she thinks that it would be weird to read long passages of text in vertical text. But then you turn to Japan, and actually it's super-duper common for vertical text to be set in Japanese, and this is a a photo of um, a Vogue magazine from Japan. And throughout that magazine, things like headlines and all the English words and the kind of like asides and captions are typeset horizontally, but the long body text is all typeset vertically. So it depends, right? Here's that magazine, and actually the spine opens in the opposite direction than it would to English. And you can see this kind of mix, this very Japanese mix of English words and um, Jap Japanese words and the way that typesetting is done. Um, I find it interesting here, this enlarged cap, the red over in that corner, marks the beginning of the text, right? 
That's what you use a big cap for, or a big character for, is to say, hey, here's the beginning. In case you were confused, it's here. And then you read this direction. While meanwhile, the horizontal text is all running left to right. So it's horizontal left to right, vertical right to left. Yeah, it gets complicated. <laughs> So Han-based systems. So how are we going to do this stuff in CSS, both the Mongolian and the Han-based systems? Uh, this brings us to the writing mode property. There are three options that are kind of out there in all the browsers right now for doing writing modes. The first is horizontal TB, horizontal top to bottom. TB, top to bottom, stands for the block direction. Writing mode vertical LR is going to be, hey, it's going to be a vertical typographic mode, but we're going to go uh, left to right, or writing mode right to left, RL. Um, and then the writing mode property doesn't say anything about whether horizontal text is typeset left to right or right to left. You do that with the dir attribute in your HTML. Right, so those are three options we've got going. They're pretty well supported. It's really been a solid two years that we've been able to use this in every browser, and we're not using it. So hello, please go tell everybody, let's use this stuff. Um, it first landed in Chrome in 2010, in Safari in 2011. Uh, these specifications were written, best I can tell, the first specification that I can find for the writing mode specification is 2010. Some of those ideas might be even older. So it's been seven years, and we definitely, it's beyond time for us to know about this stuff. Um, so, you can see here what you would do, writing mode, horizontal TB, right? Certain things I could say, hey, I want that to be horizontal TB, and then other things I could say, writing mode, vertical LR. And you can then typeset certain parts of the page. You could say, in that, like that Vogue magazine, you could kind of say, well, I want my default to be one of them, and then I want this part, and this part, and that part, this paragraph, this aside, this main, I want these to be this other. And then you could start combining those together. This is an example that Chen Hu Jing made, really beautiful example, um, up at that URL. She is a front-end developer and designer in Singapore um, of Chinese, uh, from a Chinese family, and she is really into this stuff and speaks Chinese fluently from a little kid uh, as her first language. So there's a lot of articles that she's written about this stuff that I find very fascinating. We have long conversations about culture and typography and stuff, it's really fun. Um, so this is the page, right? And if you look, it doesn't scroll up and down, and it doesn't scroll to the side. It scrolls in the other direction, right? It scrolls right to left. But you can check this checkbox and flip it. She's done it. Set the thing up so that you can just do a little checkbox hack, mark, uh, hack, and you can switch, and you can see which direction. Maybe if you read Chinese, you can kind of see which one do I like better? When might I want to use one kind of typographic mode, or when might I want to use the other? Um, Pretty interesting, and actually the code is not that complicated. If you look at it closely, you'll see there's sort of these details, like, um, let's see if I can get this to work, like this period right here, or these punctuation marks, um, they, that's where things start to get really tricky. And that might be the edge of, I'm not sure everything with the web is completely typeset properly yet, because sometimes the punctuation should be, um, centered and sometimes it shouldn't and it's sort of different for different languages and different scripts in different countries and um, it gets complicated but the other thing you might notice is that the English that's here um, right so here's some English mixed in so it's now turned sideways and these dates are also turned sideways but only because they're long um, uh, more details about stuff that gets complicated but um, basically there you go right so typesetting Asian scripts, vertical scripts, these are things we can do. But you can also use these for some really cool graphic design effects, even if you're typesetting a script that's typically horizontal. Um, here's an example that I did of an uh, access grid. Mark just said, don't bother, but here's one. It's pretty, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, where of Jen Simmons is in a vertical writing mode, or I've used vertical RL to typeset that. Um, and then I've also, at the larger viewport sizes, I've just used a simple transform, rotate 45 degrees to turn the whole thing. Um, and it's laid out with grid, so the entire thing is responsive, and it, you could change the length of the content, and the grid is going to respond to the content that's available. It's not fragile. It's not absolute positioning. Um, it works really well. And this is why I think many of us are all saying, now is the time 
to get much more creative with our graphic design because it's actually possible. It's possible to do it with you know, reasonable amount of time, not an insane amount of time coding is. It's possible to do responsibly. It's possible to do when you don't know the length of your content. So how did I do that? Well, I did that because I've got, I actually, the experimental layout lab of Jen Simmons should really be one phrase. Um, it should be a single H1 with two spans using display contents, but because display contents is only in one browser, I cheated and I wrapped them into two, H, two H1s. We need display contents in all the other browsers. Um, so on the second H1, on the phrase of Judd Simmons, I just applied a writing mode to vertical LR, and that's all it took. You can see here, um, it turns the cursor sideways, right? Because it understands that it's a different way to lay out the text. And you can see where, um, like I remove it, and you can see that this affects layout, this writing mode adjustment affects the layout, unlike transformations, uh, which makes it super useful. And then also what I'm doing, I'm showing here that the, the content is being told to be a certain, it's told, being told to be three cells high. But then if I instead, just get to compare, what if instead I used a transform rotate of 90 degrees, you can see that the rotation, transform rotate, doesn't take up any space in the layout. And so there's no way for the rest of the layout to adjust itself to make enough space for that content. Um, but, and it's, it's much better to go ahead and use uh, a vertical RL to make it make up that space, take up that space. So what if I wanted it to go the other way? What if I wanted of Jeff Simmons, instead of turning my head this direction, I turn my head this direction, and it would still work? How am I going to do that? Well, I thought, you know, I've got vertical RL. That got me that the direction I wanted. What about the other one? I'll just ver use vertical LR, and I'll get this, right? But uh, nope, that's not what that is. <laughs> um, it doesn't turn the, direction, the text the other direction. This, is what, this was the hardest part to figure out, reading the specifications. I'm like, why? Because that layout of English text running that way would mean that the inline direction is running bottom to top. And that's not what this writing mode does. This writing mode is for running inline top to bottom and block left to right. So what ends up happening is that if you put a Latin script or a horizontally, typically horizontally laid out script into vertical LR is you get text flowing like this, where it kind of feels upside down in a way because it's writing the first thing and then it's writing the other ones on top of that one or above that one in a weird way. Um, and if you look more closely at Mongolian, you can see that English text is being typeset in that same direction, right? They're both kind of turn your head to the right. Um, where if we look at that Wikipedia page, we see that the block start is over on this side, but the top of horizontally typeset scripts is going to be over on that side, which kind of feels upside down. Um, but who cares for Mongolian? Mongolian runs top to bottom. So we've got these two options. Uh, but what are we going to do if we want to... Um, you know, oh, we'll get to that in a minute. All right, so what is this? Vertical writing mode, RL. This tr triggers, so this is just an example of me using vertical RL, uh, typesetting both Chinese and English together. Um, I wanted to show it so I could zoom in and sort of show you that, like in Chinese, underlining is called side lighting. And in this example, it's on the left. I'm not quite sure that's correct. There may be times when you actually want the side lining to be on the right. More details that are being worked out in the CSS working group right now. Um, but you can see that like, the underlining of the Roman text, the, the Latin text is on the side. Right? Some of these details around like, what's going on. Some characters are upright, some characters are sideways. Which one? When are the numbers one way or the other? There's lots of little details. Um, or here's an example of writing mode, vertical LR. Um, where we can see that the like, headline seems to be on the bottom if you were just turning your head sideways, but this is because the block direction is going from the left to the right, even though the text is turned clockwise. So three options to um, summarize. We've got three options here, writing mode horizontal TB, we've got writing mode vertical LR, and we've got writing mode vertical RL. 
And the vertical RL and the vertical LR create what's called a, typo a vertical typographic mode, where kind of the mode in which the browser is in is saying, hey, what we're doing is we're setting things in a typogra uh, vertical mode. There are two more options. They work in Firefox. They have not been implemented yet in other specifications, I mean, in other browsers. I hope that can happen soon, because I think we really need these. Um, writing mode sideways RL and writing mode sideways LR, and they create a a horizontal typographic mode. The idea with these is that you are typesetting scripts that are typically typeset horizontally and you're turning them sideways. So some of those little details around the punctuation and the, the underlining and the like what happens with numbers and stuff is going to be set in what would be expected for a horizontal typographic mode turned on its side. So here's a couple examples. You can look these up later. Um, sideways RL, sideways LR, um, inspect them, check out what they do. So if you compare them, vertical LR and vertical RL, I'm sorry, vertical RL and sideways RL, um, they're very similar, although the character direction is, I mean, the character direction depends on what the Unicode characters are telling the browser to, what to do. But kind of the typographic mode, the assumption with the character direction is, is slightly different. Um, but in some ways, they're very similar. Where with the writing mode vertical LR and the writing mode of sideways LR, they're very different, right? the direction in which the characters, the, f the letters face is different, even if you're putting something like English into both of them. Uh, so all of that to say, if, as long as we don't have sideways yet, sideways LR and RL, uh, and if you are using a language, a script that is a horizontal script, and you wanna use a graphic design, you wanna use you know, some kind of cool graphic design effects, uh, I think that basically you're just going to always use vertical RL. You're not going to use vertical LR. You're going to use vertical RL for everything. Um, so that we've got covered, but how in the world are we going to do this if we don't have sideways? So this is what I say to do. Use vertical L... Oh, am I getting all confused? RL. This is left. This is right. Uh, <laughs> with text align right as well, and then transform rotate it using 180 degree transform. So why do that? Well, because by using a vertical writing mode, it will take up the amount of space that you need, and then you can spin it 180 to get it to face the other direction, but it's still taking up the space that you need, unlike leaving it horizontal and turning it 90 degrees, in which case you have no way to tell the browser how much space to take up in the layout. Um, you probably also want to just toss in a text orientation sideways, which is going to help with all of that kind of details around things like underlining and punctuation and numbers and whether or not things are coming out the way that you expect them to. If you use text orientation sideways, you're basically saying, look, this is horizontally typeset script, turn sideways. Um, but that does bring us to our third CSS property, text orientation. So text orientation, in a Han-based system, the characters are set upright. All the characters are pointing to the top of the page. And you can see in this particular example, there's some, um, like if you look at this here, it says for Mac 2011, and the 2011 is turned sideways. But then you look over here, and it says 1027, and the 1027, the 10 is fit upright. It's numbers in Chinese. Lots of times numbers in Chinese, they're all set in these Roman, this Roman script, but they're upright because that's how Chinese is typeset. Um, or here, this 2009 is also set in a Chinese fashion, upright, because this for Mac 2011 is an English phrase interjected, but these date numbers are not English phrases. They're part of Chinese, and they just happen to be written in Roman numbers, or not Roman numbers, what are those, Greek numbers? Uh, anyway, Latin numbers, and um, they're typeset upright, the way you would typeset Chinese. So again, it gets complicated, but Text orientation can like iron out some of that complication and fix things for you. So by default, the default, if you don't say anything and you've created a vertical writing mode, the browser will say, hey, we are in text orientation mixed mode, which means it's going to look at the Unicode and it's going to do its best to guess what's going on. If you want everything to be text orientation upright and you just want everything to be upright, you can use text orientation upright. If you want everything to be sideways, including Asian characters, Chinese characters, you can say text orientation sideways and it will turn everything sideways. So we have options. You may or may not ever need them, but there are options. Um, text orientation sideways is not, or um, text orientation is not as well implemented yet as writing modes. Um, you can see some red up there, but it's pretty well implemented. It's implemented well enough 
to use it, especially if you're using it to kind of fix and tweak some things that might be a little inconsistent, because, okay, so 10% of your users maybe don't have it, so those 10% of the people see the little buggy things, but that's better than 100% of the people seeing little buggy things. Um, there's a deeper view into how well supported it is in different browsers at the moment. Um, so here's an example, t writing mode, vertical, RL, text orientation, upright, where basically everything is now upright. All the English letters are upright, all the Chinese characters are upright. Underlining is still sidelining, because we're in a vertical typographic mode, and vertical typographic modes are going to create sidelining, not underlining. Um, or here, vertical LR, text orientation upright, another example that you can dig into later. Um, I just kind of made examples of every possible configuration just to see what happens. Um, and here also then, you know, to looking, comparing sideways RL and uh, uh, ver sideways and vertical, you can see that one has a vertical typographic mode with text orientation mixed, and the other one creates a horizontal typographic mode on its own. That's what sideways is going to do. It's just immediately set a horizontal typographic mode, which actually makes text, text orientation irrelevant. But. So, um, I think I said this already, right? So text orientation sideways, that's what that does. So here's some examples. Um, that I did where, fairly simple, I just took that H1 and put a writing mode of vertical RL on it. Or here, I put a writing mode of vertical RL, transform rotate 180 degrees, text align right to get it to like go to the right, although it's not right, it's up, but you get the idea, um, with text orientation sideways. Or here, you can make the letters go up, right? So vertical RL, text orientation upright, text transform uppercase, or let's just keep going, throw a transform rotate of 180 degrees on it, now my letters are upside down. Now if you notice, like this um, is kind of ugly, right? Like that looks awkward, the word winter, it looks sort of weird. So what's the deal with that? Why does that look weird? Well, it's because that font, I don't know, maybe that was Helvetica or something, wasn't really designed to be used in a vertical line. And there's a lot of tradition around sign painting. Sign painters know what it takes to make a sign where all of the letters, especially something like in English, are upright. Um, so David Jonathan Ross made this font called Bungie, where he did a bunch of research into what would it take to make a font that's going to work really well in this kind of layout um, and put this out open source. You can check it out. Um, it's interesting. I think, I think it could be cool to have, you know, the name of a website or something that you want to type, typeset in this way, but you might want to choose a different font to be able to do it. Um, so here's an example that I saw. I was just thinking about writing modes and writing about writing modes, and I, this came across my Twitter feed, and I was like, oh, uh, I want to do that with CSS Grid and writing modes and see what happens. So here's my markup. I got a main, an H1. I've done this thing where I've taken three different words in the H1. I've put each one inside of a span. HTML semantics are super important. You want to make sure that you've maintained them best that you can, wrapping each word in a span. I don't know, we were having a debate at dinner the other night about how evil that is or not. Maybe it's something we're going to start doing. Uh, but meanwhile, the rest of it, the semantics are really good. And then the second one, the nth child of two, so the word by, I've said writing mode, vertical, RL, text orientation, upright, font size 45%. Um, and this is what I got. Uh, and then I used grid, I said display grid on the H1, and then I've taken each of them, the word made, and put it in grid column, between line one and three, grid row between line one and two. Um, the word by goes between grid column line one and two, grid row two and three. The third, the word few goes between grid column two and three, grid row two and three. You can see there the Firefox developer tool has a, um, you can turn on the grid lines and starting, oh, maybe it's starting today. There's a layout panel in Nightly, Firefox Nightly. There's actually a new layout panel, and you can turn on the numbers, and you can adjust some other things, change the color, um, and see the lines, which makes laying things out in grid much, much, much easier. Um, so there we go. It's real HTML. It's real CSS. It's a uh, font, web font. Um, we can start to do the kinds of things that we used to do back in the 90s, but gave up because the accessibility and the maintainability was so terrible. Um, but now we can do them again. So 
I'm going to just summarize what I just taught you. These slides are kind of a cheat sheet, you know, if you wanted to, I don't know, have a little PDF cheat sheet or a printout, this is, these are the slides that you would want to grab. And then I'm going to go through a couple other things after that. Um, so this is, these are the three things that you put together to make up a writing mode. This is how systems like Latin work, um, left to right, horizontal typographic mode. This is a system like Arabic, horizontal typographic mode, right to left. Han-based system, there's two different options. Mongolian works like this. We've got three CSS properties, although one of them really is an HTML attribute. Direction, writing mode, and text orientation. Um, here's the code to change the, which direction the inline flow works in a horizontal typographic mode. Uh, three options for writing mode that you can use today. You've been able to use these for almost two years. Um, here are two more options that hopefully as soon as they get into a couple more browsers, we can use these. Um, three options for type text orientation. So that's writing modes. This is the, the three major properties for writing modes and all the different values that you can use for those. Um, but then I wanted to talk a little bit about what this means for the rest of layout and understanding how these ideas fit into everything else that we're doing with grid, with flexbox, with floats, with flow, layout is just an, a, a consistent flow. So you've got these ideas now, right? You've got this in your head, block, inline, block, inline. Um, and we've got block, start, block, end, inline, start, and inline, end. Rachel was talking about these. You can see very clearly with these arrows what it means to have start and end, right? Or what it means when you change the writing mode, you're redefining block start and block, block end, inline start and inline end. That's what you're doing. You're saying, I need to change the start and end for my block or my inline direction, or I need to switch which direction those two things go in. You could have it be like this, right? There's all the different combinations I just showed you. But the idea is to just understand that start and end mean things. Sometimes you need the word block or inline to be involved, and you say things like block start or inline start. Sometimes you just use the word start or you just use the word end, and you don't need the block and inline. It's kind of more obvious. For the Flexbox, for instance, you've got uh, flex start and flex end, but that's sort of a, that feels a bit like a legacy thing, like that was a good idea three years ago or so, but then Tab and Elica kind of figured out that we need to use these things in more places, so we kind of were dropping, I think at some point we won't need to say flex, blah, flex, blah, anywhere, we'll just say start and end every place. Um, there's a whole other specification, a whole other thing called logical properties, Rachel mentioned this, rather than physical properties, left and right, top and bottom are now called physical things, they're phys you're physically saying which direction you want. We're not gonna be doing that for much longer. Or maybe we will, but really, especially if you're working on a project that's going to have internationalization support, you're gonna drop that stuff like a hot potato, and we're gonna be writing code like this instead. Margin, block, start, 1M. Padding, inline, end, 1M. Border, block, end. Text, align, start. Float inline start, right? The idea, once this is fully implemented, is that any of the places that you might have said top and bottom, left and right before, you no longer say top and bottom, left and right. You now say things like inline end block start. And now you have the foundation to understand what the heck all of those things mean. Um, and they're not that hard once you have the kind of the whole mental model in your head. Um, I did see at one point somebody was making a SAS, mix in SAS library, some kind of tool um, to fix. <laughs> the new CSS, to fix Flexbox, so that you don't have to say flex start, flex end, that you would instead say right and left, justify content left or align content top. No, that is not fixing it, that is breaking it. No. <laughs> uh, instead, what you might want to do is create a, a max in, a SAS library, some kind of helper tool that does the opposite, that lets you do float Inline start now, even though uh, float left is, you know, the logical properties are not fully supported yet, and then the SAS could then spit out float left and stuff like that. That would be helpful, do that. Um, but really, it's the duty of us uh, as an industry to just get this stuff under our skin. It's not that hard once you've used it for a while, um, because the world is a big place, and there's many different kinds of people out there, and we should not be biasing everything towards one particular culture over the others.
Here is the support for logical properties. It's fully supported in Firefox. It's supported in a lot of browsers with a little bit of a note, but the note isn't actually that big a deal. Um, it's not in IE, and nothing ever new will ever be in IE, sad face. Um, it will be in Edge, I hope, at some point. Maybe go upvote it. Uh, the folks at Microsoft definitely listen to what gets upvoted. And logical properties is one of these things that you're like, what is that? I don't know. We'll just use left. We don't need that thing. Um, but really, we want, we would really like this whole system to be complete. We really want all that layout stuff to be totally complete and have all the pieces, because without all the pieces, it's kind of annoying. Um, there is the specification, logical properties, and values, level one. Uh, then we've got alignment. So quickly, the alignment module, box alignment module, this stuff was born in the Flexbox module, but then it crawled out of there and grew up and became its own thing. Um, you probably, maybe many of you have gone over and over to Chris Coyer's CSS complete guide to Flexbox, um, CSS tricks, uh, trying to remember what the heck, what the heck? I looked at this page so many times because I could not remember which was which at all. It turns out that there are gonna be six, not just four, but six with grid because you've got uh, justify items, you got justify content, align content, justify items, align items, justify self, align self. So the hard part really is remembering which way is justify and which way is align. Um, but I, you know, once I learned the writing mode specification, I literally never looked these up again. So this is why I'm telling this to you, because I hope this is helpful for you as well. If we think about block and inline, you think about alignment, alignment is in the block direction. Most of the time. Not all the time, I'll talk about that in a minute, but most of the time, alignment has to do with the block direction. So if you switch writing modes, it's gonna switch what alignment does. Justify is in the inline direction. Justify inline. Think justification, like if, you're, if you come from typography, like this idea of justif justifying type, uh, justification, inline direction. Of course, with Flexbox, we've got cross-axis and main-axis. By default, the cross-axis is in the block direction, and the main-axis is in the inline direction, but you can switch those. Uh, but it means that when you're using flex direction row, that alignment is in the cross-axis, justify, right? So alignment is still in the block direction, and justify is still in the inline direction. But if you switch the flex direction column, you did not switch writing modes. You just switched flex direction but it switches what justify and align do. It changes. This is the one situation where you can switch justify and align without switching writing modes, is in Flexbox. Um, talking to Elika recently, she was like, hmm, I wonder, maybe we shouldn't have done it that way. Too late. There's no time machine, so too late. Um, justify and align, they do switch without switching the writing modes. But grid is different. With grid, alignment is gonna go in the block direction, Justify is going to go in the inline direction. If you switch your writing modes, it changes what that means. But in a horizontal TB writing mode, it looks like this diagram. Uh, this is also LTR. A grid autoflow row, right? This is grid autoflow row. We get our boxes going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, if we switch to grid autoflow column, our boxes go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But a line is still in the block direction and justify is still in the inline direction. That does not change with grid. So that's the difference between grid and flexbox. Too bad, but uh, overall, except for that thing with flexbox, overall, if you can just remember a line in block direction, justify in inline direction, that will hopefully help you. Uh, I wrote an article about writing modes. Um, it has a little less information than this talk, but if you want to read it later, you want to share it with other people, this is a good resource, um, along with the work that Jing has written. Um, I also have, uh, was mentioned at the beginning, uh, labs.gensimmons.com, where all of these examples were, are posted, along with tons and tons of other examples of what you can do with writing modes, what you can do with grid, what you can do with all of this new layout. Thanks. Incredible, as if grid alone wasn't enough. This is just <laughs> mind, mind blowing. I need more minds. <laughs> um, so there's room for one question. Yes, yeah, sorry. But we have hundreds and thousands of questions. Um, Tweet me, I'll answer your questions. I, I think we need more time for experimentation and more room for experimentation. Any tips for people here on how to make sure that you get more time for experimentation 
when you work in a, at an agency or somewhere. Yeah, I mean, that's, I guess that's probably the biggest blocker for many people is that we need to ship real stuff now. And, but I, I do believe that there's a need and a space for doing really good work and for doing creative work and for bringing a lot of graphic design onto the web and for, you know, even just to fight fake news, to like have real voice and tone and know where you are when you land on a website, that you know that you're at a certain website. Um, and we just have to make the time. So if you know, people work for an employer who doesn't understand why that's important, um, you can quit and go somewhere else. I mean, Mark was talking about how like, there was a desperate need for good designers. So I think in a way it is about finding spaces where that will let you do that. Um, I also think it's about not asking permission. You know, like, you just use CSS Grid without asking permission. Somebody's going to come along, your, your, really your boss's boss's boss is going to come along and go, how come you didn't use a float-based layout on this particular, right? <laughs> they don't know. Um, and, I, and I think just, you know, a lot of people do it by carving out time on, on weekends or at night, you know, doing it on their personal time. Um, but, you know, sometimes there's just, it really, like, sometimes there is space in the day at work. And instead of getting on Facebook, you could, like, make a grid example and play around. So. <laughs> Yeah. That's a very good one. Okay, thank you very, very much. Jen Simmons, everybody. <laughs>